Greetings. Today's talk focuses on kind of three areas. The first we look at is hypermilling as a way to get to a 400 mile range in the Model 3. This also may include some dietary measures for the Model 3 on your vehicle. The second thing we're covering today is a um, uh, what I call the Elon Musk battleship problem. And I think as we get into it, you'll understand what this is about and the implications that'll happen over the next couple of weeks. And then finally, we sort of have some small cleanup items in terms of what's going on with Tesla right now um, and, and can go from there. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Thanks once again for joining us. I have ducked in our title today because our water location here, uh, we're at the National Harbor in Washington, D.C and uh, we get a chance to pick up some of the views and one of the views is kind of the battle of the ducks so i'm trying to take the view in in terms of our production and also trying to work with the sunlight in the process uh, please note we do have some ads in here five seconds to seven seconds of watch time helps us build the channel in terms of helping to cover costs uh, we also have a Patreon page that facilitates us getting equipment to upgrade the quality of our channel. and would appreciate your support in that regard. And then finally, uh, please like and subscribe. If you hit the bell icon, it makes sure you know when we have a new show going on. Uh, I will note that uh, we do, we've tended to do live shows of late and we'll respond to you at the end of the show because most of the uh, folks have asked us not to delay middle of show in order to uh, make sure that uh, we don't um, affect the flow of the show. And then also, uh, you know, thanks for your viewership and time uh, spent with us. Your like also influences our ranking. So my first discussion topic today is focused on, in general, a concept called hypermilling. So if you're an owner of XS or Model 3, there's a use case that I've been fascinated by for a long time, which is that about half our viewers in the United States and half of those are in California. So what I'm fascinated by as a use case is the fact that there's a run between uh, Los Angeles and, um, and San Francisco, and it's kind of the number one traffic space for Tesla right now. What if, if you drive that route regularly, there's a location there called, um, uh, I'm blanking on it right now, it's a Harris Ranch. So Tesla has made Harris Ranch kind of their test facility for most new ideas. If you go to that location, take a look at the Tesla facility for battery swapping. It was built by Tesla because they ran into a problem where they were trying to figure out would customers want to take time to charge their vehicle up or did they want to possibly pull into a facility and in 15 minutes they could have the battery pack that they have in a vehicle swapped for another battery pack. So the conclusion that the company came to was that even though the battery pack swap was quicker, decision made that uh, by the customers that there, everybody owns a battery in their vehicle. And the concern that many people had is, what if Tesla puts a battery pack that's been abused in my vehicle? At least I know how I've managed the battery pack in my vehicle versus somebody else's battery pack being installed that may be in a bad situation. So I bring all this up because um, we kind of generate the use cases and the solutions in the United States, and then they're rolled out into other places around the world, big exception being Tesla seems to not like to do cold weather testing in the United States. They do it in Australia and other places. And we easily in California have pretty high mountains, I think 12,000 feet to test that situation. So, you know, doesn't make sense to me, but who cares? The next, so the reason I'm focused on that use case is there's a question. And the question is, if you drive from Los Angeles going north to San Francisco, the natural stop point ends up being about 200 miles out at a place called Harris Ranch or Kettleman City, which is the newest and largest charging facility in the United States. What's interesting about this facility is Elon Musk and Tesla have run into some difficulties. 
what is that difficulty? The difficulty is there's high usage rates. Um, and we're also in a flight path, as you can tell. Sorry about that. Um, so the, the problem that uh, has popped up is that there's a, an issue going on, which is most of the consumers that run that route tend to do it on Friday night or Sunday night. On Friday night, they're heading to San Francisco, let's say. On Sunday night, they're heading back from San Francisco home in Los Angeles. So this results in very high um, uh, rates of waits. So I've heard of a wait time as much as three hours. So one of Tesla's solutions has been to install a second location. They're one exit from each other. So you can kind of look at the, uh, the your dash and figure out which is going to be a shorter wait if you want to get charged. Um, so there's an interesting question that comes up and sort of the core of what this show is about, which is how can I extend my vehicle mileage? So why is this a big deal? Well, guess what? You have a choice. Number one choice is run at 60 or 65 miles an hour with your air conditioning or your heat on, let's say from Los Angeles to this facility. Once you get there, you now have a problem you have to wait uh, for as long as three hours before you can charge up. So why is that a big deal? Not a big deal. Do you wanna spend the extra three hours waiting or not? Another solution is from a hyper milling standpoint, if you run at about 30 miles an hour between the two places, your vehicle will get in the range of 500 miles. So this introduces the question of what's the rate of speed that allows me to pick up miles in terms of range of my vehicle that allows me not to have to stop someplace and wait for three hours. So in theory, if you run it around an average of 45 miles an hour, um, basically from Los Angeles to San Francisco, in theory, you get just under 400 miles of range. Even better than that, it allows you to pick a recharge facility that's not the same one that everybody's doing. So I think this issue is gonna affect people around the world in different locations in terms of how fast do you want to go. Another variable in this whole thing is should you potentially pack a portable heater or, or um, air conditioning facility in your car? That way it might take some weight, but it allows you to eliminate using heater air, which also can eat into the range that your vehicle has and give you more range, whether it's on this run or not. So I've been kind of focused on this use case for quite a while because I think it's an interesting thing. If you can get that 400 miles uh, for your range out of the vehicle at, let's say, just about 50 miles an hour, or using other hyper milling techniques like drafting some of the large trucks that are running up and down the freeway to pick up an extra 40, 50 miles, you, even at, at 60 miles an hour, you now have the benefit of you, lo you lose time you know, in terms of uh, 20 or 25 minutes or a half hour in terms of how fast you could be going as you move between the two spots, or you could pick, uh, you, so you lose time by going slower, but you pick up time when it comes to having to go in and charge with largest number, numbers of people in front of you. I think as we increase the number of Model 3s on the road, we're gonna see a lot more competition for the charging facilities that we get to. So, at any rate, there's a concept called hypermilling. There are a whole bunch of different things that are associated with it, which include drafting on vehicles in front of you like large trucks, a little bit dangerous, but it does work. You also have uh, variables like uh, speed, use of AC air, um, computer capabilities, or the radio, all of which drain battery life. And so these might be variables to think about as you're evaluating how can I get the maximum number of miles out of my vehicle in any circumstance. The next topic I wanted to di dive into is what I call, I kind of call it the, the battleship phenomenon of Elon Musk. So I don't know if any of you have grown up in a family situation where there's a little bit of mental illness in the family, but I certainly am one of those folks. And what I've noticed particularly about my mom was that um, my mom's a little bit of a battleship where if everything was running smoothly, she would say or do something that would introduce all kinds of issues that allowed there to be a problem that she would have to solve. And so anytime things were going well, et cetera, et cetera, I could expect there's gonna be this, oh no, what is this new phenomenon? So 
as you all noted from this week, Elon Musk did a um, uh, made a tweet, and that tweet cost the company probably a billion dollars in market cap relative to being sued for calling somebody a pedo. Now, that's a minor example of how the battleship process works. But in general, uh, I would say that now that we are right about at the 5,000, 6,000 a week production rate for the Model 3, I'm fully expecting because Elon likes sort of craziness, uncertainty, that he has to solve that problem. I'm expecting in the next month that Tesla slash Elon, through Elon Musk, will introduce some kind of problem problem that requires focused attention to solve. And if that doesn't occur naturally, he'll create it. So for those of you who are rooting for Tesla, if you're expecting this to happen, you're, you're wise in your anticipation of craziness because things are stabilizing in Tesla in terms of how well they're managing things. Now, there is a rule, and I think Tesla is observing this, which is called kind of the the 20 percent rule so in silicon valley um, one of the long range sort of um, business ideas i'm getting jammed by that plane here is a concept called um, it, it, it's basically a concept called if 80 80 percent of what you're doing um, is working well you need to take 20 percent of what you're doing and take some risks with it so uh, in the case of Tesla, we've seen a lot of risk being taken by the company over time. The latest risk that they've managed to get out of is the fact that uh, Elon Musk announced that we were complete idiots in terms of our design. The fact is that um, there are things that work in PowerPoints, you know, relative to robots on the factory floor or in other cases. But when you actually try to do those things, they completely don't work. So you'll notice that the company has a trend where there'll be a discussion of a topic, be it, you know, for example, Elon pointed out that the uh, construct um, was too complex and therefore they weren't able to get the throughput of cars that they wanted to do. So if you think about it, there's an issue that popped up, which is Tesla had a very smooth operating facility that Toyota left them in terms of how things are structured to allow the vehicles to move through and successfully complete your vehicle. So Tesla was like, hey, we're going to figure out how to beat Toyota at its own lean manufacturing and high quality game. And that, it, that, it, that was by going heavy automation. That did not work. And so they've pulled back from that automation and hopefully the lessons of Toyota will be embraced rather than them trying to battle that demon in order to win a faster production line possibly that, and sort of fewer humans that are associated with robots. So hopefully they've learned their lesson. I'm hoping that they chill out on in terms of uh, trying to dominate the factory floor with, uh, with robots. But I think Elon is pretty stubborn about technology being superior to humans. So I wouldn't be surprised if we go through another bout of this uh, in the next factory that, uh, that we go into, which therefore results in more losses. And then finally they embrace the lessons and this also goes back to our last show about the fact that Tesla slash Elon is doing sort of an on-the-job MBA, where instead of doing a regular MBA, he makes a whole bunch of mistakes that MBAs told him not to do, and then he believes them, and now he's modified his process to embrace. In this case, he's making a whole bunch of mistakes that Toyota, with 70 years of vehicle production and 50 years of top-quality auto production, do not make and now he's sort of embracing their logic and blending that into how the company actually works. So um, in my mind, this is a sort of interesting process about how the company works. Now, for a practical matter, I wanted to encourage you guys to check us out on Tesla Fan Insight on Facebook as well, because what we're doing is posting weekly photos of, the, uh, of our service facility near uh, the Washington, D.C. area. There are different colors to check out. There's um, changes in terms of uh, service process where instead of a Tesla loaner, you're now getting um, an enterprise rental car that's sitting on the facility. There are interesting changes in terms of vehicles being made available for repair work, et cetera. So there's a lot of sort of data that flows from getting a chance to just look through the service facility weekly. 
And I think that another one is just the fact that under different color and dirt conditions, you can get a feel for what colors people are choosing and how those look. And even, you know, maybe get a, a general sense of the type of repair issues slash damage that vehicles are incurring as you see them in the service queue sitting at the facility. Um, the uh, sort of final note that I wanted to jump into is uh, the fact that, hey, um, right now Tesla is at the front of mind share for many people in terms of what they're doing. If there's nothing positive to report, there's got to be something negative. So it's interesting to watch what dominates the headlines on, on a part of Tesla. But I'm thrilled to see customers getting their vehicles. The final note that I wanted to cover today focuses on uh, iPhone 10 issues with Model 3 owners. What this focuses on is the fact that I ran into a Model 3 owner here at the charging facility in Inner Harbor of Washington, D.C. He inv informed me that he ran into a problem at BWI Airport in, San in the Washington, D.C. area because he wasn't carrying his card with him and he was using his phone to interface with the car. What ended up happening is when he went into the charging space, there was no connectivity to Verizon from that uh, charging space. So when he got back, he couldn't get in the car. So he was able to interface with his wife and she was able to provide codes that at least gave him two minutes to get to the car and get it open. I guess the moral of that, that story is if you get used to using your iPhone 10, you might want to read up on what's going on in that interface, particularly with no connectivity potentially impacting. Obviously, the solution is to carry your card, but if you've got to carry the phone anyway, why bother with a card? And so this introduces the fact that keeping your card with you can be handy, uh, etc. cetera. any rate, um, I'm gonna have to sign off right now, but I wanna thank you for uh, Thank you for your comments regarding this. Wrote Hoda Hafez, and look forward to our next conversation.